Welcome to the Sports Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Lure, and I'm excited to cross over today to San Francisco to catch up with Mr. Gangan Palrecha. Welcome to the podcast, Gangan. Thank you for having me. Yeah, now looking forward to a great hour of talking metaverse and NFTs and all that exciting space, which even in the crypto winter is clearly a very hot topic, and I'm sure we'll hear plenty more about it. Uh, especially, obviously, with your fairly recent role in Dapper Labs uh, as the VP of Operations there, and of course now in your new role as the CEO of NFT Stars. But as we always do in this podcast, we start a bit earlier, and you are a engineer. Well, you are a bit of a sports guy, uh, I think, growing up there, uh, an engineer by training. So take us back to uh, to your university uh, and your early jobs there. Yeah, that's right. So I grew up very, very deeply involved in sports uh, and music. And, uh, and so growing up, I played AAU basketball. I played you know, very uh, competitive tennis. Uh, I was a soccer player um, mm -hmm. for many, many years. And, um, and you know, in, in university, I studied computer engineering and computer science. And so, um, you know, and then on the music side, I've been involved in, you know, putting on live music, playing music. And so for me personally, I've always been uh, drawn to creating, uh, you know, spaces for the arts and for sports to flourish and participate sort of whenever I can. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I, I went to university for computer science, computer engineering, um, you know, in the dot com boom time right. uh, and actually ended up leaving university just a bit early. Uh, I eventually finished my uh, my degree but left a little bit early to basic, because I was basically drawn to and enamored by the startup scene uh, in San Francisco. Right. And so, you know, way back in 99, 2000, um, you know, I joined a company called Loud Cloud uh, that, ha that was founded by a number of people, including uh, Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz. Right. So this was, you know, post uh, Netscape, but pre the, uh, the venture firm that, that many people know about today. Right. And, and yeah, so I started my career in engineering. Um, you know, I'd founded a record label uh, a few years prior um, and uh, ran that as well. Uh, most of the time it was sort of in parallel with, with the things that I was doing in engineering just because I wanted to sort of keep that part of my life alive. Okay. And all throughout this time also continuing to play, you know, pick up sports and intramurals and, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, but I got my start basically in engineering at Loud Cloud, moved through a few different, you know, organizations, all startups, um, you know, mm -hmm. pre-dot-com boom, then through what, you know, people would call the dot-com bust, right. you know, into the mobile world, did some stints internationally uh, in India, uh, worked at a company that was splitting operations in Zurich and the U.S., and, uh, m you know, made my move at some point into a uh, more product management role. Mm -hmm. And so I've always loved engineering, but one of the things I've always wanted to do is I've I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so my record company, the first time records was sort of a, an entry point into being an entrepreneur. Um, and I built the company, I founded the company, built it from scratch into a few million um, in sales mm -hmm. uh, through to a distribution deal with Universal Music Group. Um, and, and music is great, but but my heart was always in sort of the uh, technology world. Right. And so for me, wanting to continue to build my skill set uh, within technology, I had some great mentors early on, you know, moved from engineering to product management, where I understood how to think about product broadly and and work on building towards product market fit. And then moved into business development at a company called Zatu uh, that was doing um you know, IPTV uh, before streaming of television was was a thing, yeah. and uh, you know we were launched in Europe as well as the as well as the U.S. Founded my first uh, content, technology. Content was on the platform. I have to admit, I, the name does not quite ring a bell. Um, what what was what were you guys streaming at the time? Yeah, so Zatu currently, I, I believe, still exists and is based is based in Switzerland. Okay. Uh, and we were doing uh, uh, cable and 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 broadcast uh, and network retransmission. So we were working with, uh, uh, like basically television channels, uh, and satellite pr and and sort of cable providers uh, in France, in Spain, in Germany, okay. uh, and in and in Switzerland. 
Uh, and in the U.S., we were streaming, um, you know, more cable oriented because the uh, the broadcast network stuff is a little bit harder to uh, to come by. And we were really the first the first live streaming television platform uh, uh, yeah, prior you to call uh, it the world's first virtual cable operator. Okay, well, that, tell, that's talk right. About, yeah, talk a bit about it. What 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 was the vision or what what we, the company were doing? Really, what was the idea? I mean, you know, peer-to-peer -peer networks were 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 going in and out of favor. Right. Uh, people wanted to consume television content, and up until that point, all the content that was being streamed was essentially uh, made for mobile content. Mm -hmm. So they were they were um, uh, let's say it was produced content specifically for consumption on mobile phones. So it wasn't live content, it, and it wasn't even full content. It was. Mm -hmm. You know, it was shortened, short form sort right. of content. And we wanted to deliver live television directly to your phone or directly to your to your laptop. Right. And so that was really the the idea built on top of this sort of peer to peer network that we built to reduce, you know, uh, the latency, latency and streaming costs. Right. And so we we did that. And, and I, I believe we were the first company to ever stream, you know, major sporting events. So. Um, we streamed, I believe it was UEFA back in what 2007, I think. Right, right. Uh, yeah, that is definitely very early days. Uh, we're talking about uh, streaming, really, as you said, wasn't really quite there yet. Um, you know, IPTV was really the buzzword I ran around the time, right? The telcos started to compete with uh, traditional pay TV operators and so on. So I guess that's sort of the the area, the area you the, you were fitting in there. Uh, but your next role then, um, where you spent a couple of years, obviously, again, that was a fairly major platform, which uh, the name sort of rings a bell with Peacock there, uh, and you were the CEO. Uh, talk a bit about that. Yeah, sure. So Peacock was basically building marketing, streaming, and direct-to-consumer uh, retail services. Essentially, SaaS, SaaS is, you know, it was a SaaS platform before SaaS was really a term. Right. And... Uh, and we were building this for basically the music industry, um, for artists, for record labels, for distributors. And the the big thing at the time was iTunes was distributing and selling MP3s essentially uh, to an audience right. that was purchasing directly through iTunes. And at that time, you know, artists and record labels, they didn't own the relationship with their users. Right. And you know, I think that's a really important point even today, which is, you know, we'll get into it later, but one yeah. of the big things about NFT Star, right? So as an artist, if you don't own the relationship with your user, it's very, very hard to figure out how to promote an upcoming album, to promote a tour, to sell merchandise, uh, right. you know, amongst amongst many other things that are not necessarily commerce driven. And so we wanted to basically empower um, artists and record labels to take that power back. And so nowadays it's very commonplace to see on an artist's website that they're selling a new CD or a new LP uh, or a bundle of a t-shirt plus an LP, uh, you know, plus a poster, right. for example. Right. And we were the first company to introduce that. Uh, to the uh, to the music world, I, I shouldn't say we were the first. Uh, there there was another company at the time that we were competing with, uh, that we have we had a lot of respect for, and and uh, you know I'm still close with the uh, the former CEO of that company. But we were the first, you know, we were the first company or set of companies that introduced that to the market, along with allowing people to sell MP3s directly to their users through an you know an API based um, a bit API based platform. Uh, and then the ability for users to put in an email address and get an MP3 in advance of an album, and then being able to take that email address, map the IP address to a location, right. and now deliver analytics back to the artist in terms of where their fans are located and so on and so forth. Right. So The early days of NFTs, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> yeah, in many ways, it's certainly uh, you know, uh, important groundwork there. Yeah. And again, it kind of goes back to this this thing that I've always loved to do, which is I love music, I love sports, I love to collect things myself, mm -hmm. and I've always created spaces for, let's say, for artists to flourish. Um, that that has, if I look back, that has always been something that was really important to me, even in my early uh, life. You know, putting on concerts for friends' bands. Many of those bands then went on to be quite famous. You know, a decade later. 
um, but always creating spaces for art and artists to flourish and create sort of new opportunities, you know, for people to, con for, you know, for artists to correct, connect with their... Where, where was Pico based uh, at the time? We were originally based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and then halfway through the business, we, you know, we moved to... Uh, to California. Right. Okay. So that, that is sort of how you then landed in California at that time then around. So we're now eight, 2008, 2010 here. Is that where you're sort of the, your San Francisco Bay area career started? So it started actually back at loud cloud in 99, 2000. Mm -hmm. And then I moved to, so I moved to India in 2004, lived in India from 2004 to 2006, you know, sort of chasing new adventures. Right. Came back to the Bay Area, and then Zatu was split between Zurich and Ann Arbor. So that's how I ended up back in Ann Arbor uh, and, and sort of stayed there for a bit as well before coming back to the Bay Area. So you went a bit to, back to your roots since you're originally from India, right? Yeah, that's in right. Between. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Well, let's let's have a look at the the next block here. You uh, you spent again several roles here uh, with interesting companies from Sherpley. I'm not sure I pronounce that properly. Get around, etc. Um, before we then again get to um, later on here, obviously with our, the Depo Labs side of things, um, let's talk about a couple of those ones. Uh, you know, so where where again you further developed your mindset of what you're doing now and and you know the world you now you know in. Yeah, if if I look at Chirply, for example, and then even some of the other the other companies, which you know I'll talk about, it, again, it was always creating spaces for art and celebrities to flourish uh, and create direct relationships with the fans and followers. So Chirply was a company uh, that went through Y Combinator in 2010. Uh, so early days of Y Combinator, not the very very early days, but you know our cohort at the time was probably about 30ish companies. Whereas now, you know, Y Combinator has grown and become kind of a household name. And Chirply was, was again, creating um, a, a space for graphic designers to flourish. Mm -hmm. And um, graphic designers would create designs. Our community would vote on their favorite designs. Okay. And the best designs voted on by our community would get turned into greeting cards, notebooks, posters, other paper goods that we would essentially then retail um, so creating revenue opportunities for designers. Um, Sounds very NFT opening. already again. <laughs> before yeah, exactly. the word existed, I guess, right? Because we're yeah, still talking exactly. 210, 213 here. So um, when, when does the word NFT actually in your world? I mean, I'm, I'm not sure when I heard it the first time, but when, when did you ever, when did that, that term really started to become uh, known? Yeah, for me, I think, you know, NFT started to come into my lexicon probably 2016, 2017. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so from Chirply to get around to General Motors, I mean, these were these were me exploring, you know, for me, I've all every every role I've taken, I've always wanted to learn something new mm -hmm. and um, and take on a new challenge. So moving from music to, uh, you know, paper goods, you know, two sided marketplaces to get around, which is, you know, a car sharing uh, platform, a peer to peer car sharing fl platform um, to fuzzy pet health, which is, you know, on demand in home care uh, for your pets. These were all new things that I had never done before. And in 2013, um, you know, a number of my friends were really, uh, you know, were really interested in blockchain and specifically right. Bitcoin. And a lot of them were starting companies at the time around uh, Bitcoin and blockchain. And that's when I started getting into uh, into that world of crypto. Did you buy um, some so Bitcoin at that time too? I hope you did. <laughs> <laughs> no comments. Uh, no comment on uh, <laughs> on that side. But, okay. but yeah, I own I own uh, I own Bitcoin from you know back in 2013, nice. um, and then ETH uh, as ETH sort of came to uh, fruition, um, and I found it very very fascinating the idea of blockchain and this idea of you know a, a, a distributed ledger that can prove ownership. And that ownership can be applied to sort of to, to digital items, mm -hmm. and you're not beholden to governments, you're not beholden to companies, because it's this distributed system, and no one can take away the thing that you own. Right. You know, it's it's this immutable thing that you can prove that you own, and so I've always been fascinated from the early days uh, uh, that concept. So for me, it wasn't about Bitcoin. Uh, and I had many conversations with people who were Bitcoin skeptics. And I said, look, it's not about Bitcoin. It's about the blockchain. Right. And Bitcoin is a great use case um, of that uh, of that technology. And um, and so that's when I started getting into it. 
Uh, and then I got into NFTs roughly around, you know, 2017. Um, and then, you know, I had, I had held off on moving into, uh, into this world professionally. I'd always been waiting for some serious implementation right, okay. of, of, of the blockchain. And what's interesting is that the serious implementation in my mind sort of never came. Um, and finally I realized, you know, it had been in front of me this whole time and this idea of NFTs had been in front of me. Uh, and that was the thing that I believed was going to sort of blow open the consumerization of blockchain. And since then we've seen NFTs grow, come to fruition. We've seen DeFi, you know, grow and, and, and other, and many other things um, around blockchain um, starting to sort of percolate now. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's let's maybe we we sort of jump straight in it now uh, since that's uh, obviously the juicy part of this conversation um dapa labs um you joined them uh there in 221 uh and we spent you know the last uh, i guess two years there uh you know first of all you know ha when you joined them um what was the company at that time um uh, because if i thinking back now Dapper's, uh, you know, the NBA Top Shot. That was just about that time when it's about you know a year or two ago when they, when it was launched. Um, so it, you know it, the company wasn't you know maybe known before in in the Silicon Valley area, but to the world, uh, I don't think anyone you know sort of heard about it before. Uh, what was the, what's the original Dapper Labs all about? And then you know when you joined them, what did you guys uh, you know how did we get to the NBA Top Shot story? Yeah, I think in crypto and in blockchain, you know, Dapper has been a company and the founders have been, um, you know, a, a group of people that have been, you know, pretty well known uh, in in those very specific circles. And NBA yeah. Top Shot really is the thing, I think, that, it, that, that brought the company to the mainstream. Absolutely. Um, it all goes back, you know, to CryptoKitties, really. I mean, there's some history prior to that, but it all gets back to CryptoKitties, which is an NFT uh, project that uh, the founders of Dapper launched. This was before right. Dapper existed. And, and, it, and it was one of the early, very, one of the early, very successful uh, NFT projects. Right. And you know, the, the short summary is that you know, they were so successful, it showed sort of the, the challenges with the Ethereum network and the Ethereum blockchain around congestion and cost. And this was back in you know, 2017 and 2018. And that's when the company thought, hey, you know, we should build uh, we should build a blockchain of our own. So Dapper built Flow, um, and you know that's what kicked off sort of this exploratory effort from the company uh, in terms of like what should what should the company do in terms of NFTs. And there were a number of iterations, just like any game studio would iterate through, mm -hmm. you know, games that they would create. You know, you're trying to find the thing that really resonates with your users. And in 2020. You know, there weren't a lot of companies, well, there were no companies really that were interested in, in, in exploring this idea of NFTs. And so the company was rejected over and over and over by many, many different, di different potential IP partners. Right. And, you know, NBA was one that wanted to take a risk. And, right. um, you know, it's proven to be really valuable risk, uh, a really fruitful risk that they took. And so, um, you know, the NBA Top Shot product came of 2020 and and you know it did okay i don't think it did particularly well in the private beta and by the time the company launched a public beta which was at the tail end of 2020 things were really starting to move and by q1 and q2 of 2021 in many ways that was the height of yes. um of nft mania and uh and i and, and i strongly believe that nba top shot and dapper labs without that product we may not we, we may not have seen the depth or 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 i would say the broadness um of the broad appeal of nfts to people that are not necessarily you know let's say crypto native yeah i totally agree um i've had a guest on the podcast before and, and his comment was that sports um brings you know new new products or new services to masses to mass audiences and that's true right pay tv probably wouldn't have never taken off in the way it is has took off you know 20 years ago without sports content driving it in around the world right? if you think of espn um you know clearly it was on the forefront before you know other products or other services came up um and i think that's similar here uh, like you said the nba top shots and now of course other nft project there 
um, or is driving that and, and bringing it to a mass audience. So it's, it's a really interesting uh, analogy, I think. Um, now, when you joined them, um, they had done the deal. And, and again, that the MBA is always on the forefront of, of technology uh, as well. Again, I had several MBA uh, people from the MBA in it, and, and it always comes across in the conversation that uh, they're always looking for the next thing and, and willing to stick their neck out a bit and test, try new things. And, uh, and uh, you know, clearly, you know, with, uh, with NBA Top Shot, there's a per- great examples. The numbers thrown around, again, I'm not sure the latest ones, but I, I remember seeing, you know, over close to, you know, billion dollars worth of uh, trading volumes, et cetera. Right? These are significant numbers. That doesn't mean there's all money in the pocket to the NBA, obviously, right? There are certain fees and structures, of course, in place, but, uh, you know, it is significant. Uh, this was not small. Um, now, when you joined them, uh, were you involved in the, the, the Top Shop project or where, which site were you exactly on uh, with the, in Dapper Labs? Yeah, that's right. I was involved uh, directly in Top Shot as well as the infrastructure around um, uh, around Top Shot and the and and what we would call the middleware of Dapper Labs. Right. So that was all uh, that, that was all my area. And you know, there were a lot of learnings. I mean, I think on one hand, sports really does uh, you know uh, sports can really accelerate a lot of things. Um, but in many ways, I think the the genius was taking uh, a mechanic. Uh, that had existed for decades, right, around trading cards. I was right. a collector of trading cards myself. And, um, and and bringing a new generation sort of into that excitement. And I also think the evolution of sports, I mean, you talk about ESPN, you talk about if we, if we want to talk about team sports and teams that people follow, I mean, there's been a progression of like of sport uh, into celebrity, right, where right. you have teams uh, that that have been very well recognized. And before the call, we were – you know, we, uh, you know, we were talking about, you know, Man U and Liverpool, but, you know, there are teams that, that have been celebrated for years and we're slowly moving. I shouldn't say slowly. We've been moving into a world of, of, of an individual athlete as a celebrity. And so I think, you know, this progression uh, has been happening for many, many years and many decades. And we're at a point now where there are certain athletes that have such high profiles uh, that can really do great things, uh, both from their own brand perspective, but also do great, you know, for the world around them. And we're seeing a lot of that develop in sport as well. Absolutely. And technology is enabling a lot of that. Yeah, and we'll, we'll definitely talk some more about when we come to NFT stars. But I want to stick a little bit more on, on Dapper Labs here um, and, and just dig a little deeper in your experience. Um, and, and again, look at it from what worked and what didn't work. Um, you know, I recall, again, during the hype, there was uh, users complaining they couldn't sell things. You know, certain times uh, the back end was, I'm not sure what, what, what crashing is the right word here. Um, as an engineer, I'm sure you <laughs> would disagree with that comment. But uh, tell us about it. What was the challenges uh, Dapper was facing um, at the height and peak uh, and, and maybe now? Yeah, I mean, there, there definitely were challenges, like just like any growing, fast-growing technology company, and and I think the team was was definitely a high-quality team that was able to, um, you know, rise to the occasion to make sure that the that the product and the platform continue to operate well. But aside from the technology of it, you know, there are other challenges um, uh, that uh, again. It's really important that any company and Dapper took took care of the users to make sure that they had great experiences. At the end of the day, users having great experiences, the most important thing, and anything get, getting in the way of those great experiences is a problem. And yeah. so the company definitely went went through some growing pains. I mean, you mentioned you mentioned some of the problems. I mean, there was some uproar about users not being able to withdraw their funds. Right. Um, so if you sold an NFT and you had, let's say, money sitting in your account, um, wanting to move that money from the, you know, from Top Shot, uh, broadly speaking, into, let's say, your bank account, and and there were some delays, for example, around that. But you know, like like any new platform, you know, there's challenges that you discover along the way, right? And so. You know, we were dealing certainly with regulatory challenges, you know, anti-money laundering regulations, right. you know, and so we needed to make sure, number one, that we were releasing funds appropriately. And, you know, to be honest, we didn't have a massive team of people, let's say, you know, reviewing withdrawals. It was a pretty small team. 
And so uh, as a backlog started to develop, we were looking at opportunities to increase our throughput on those requests. And, you know, I, I would say within relative short order, we were, we were able to go from, you know, I would say pretty significant negative sentiment. And then within, you know, a matter of a few weeks, I think our turnaround on withdrawals uh, became less than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And I think that's still probably better than many other platforms out there even today. Um, Absolutely. And so, so, so that's one challenge, you know, the blo you know, blockchain and the evolution of blockchains, obviously another challenge. And you still see the Ethereum when NFT projects are released today. There's a massive influx of people trying to buy those, buy and mint those NFTs, which slows down the network. Uh, and it also massively increases cost for anyone trying to transact um, on that chain. And Flow didn't necessarily have the cost challenges, but certainly had the throughput challenges. And so I think the company and, and the teams did, did, did well uh, to sort of manage a lot of that. And then there's a the whole world of, you know, uh, bots and people trying to, you know, get more than their fair share of, right. uh, of the new drops. And, you know, that's an ongoing thing that, you know, many platforms are, are still trying to figure out. Um, you know, there was, an, there was an NFT drop recently, um, you know, a project I think called the Saudis. And, and this was a problem. Like one person ended up having like yeah, 200 wallets that they created and they were able to mint all these NFTs. And so that was something, again, that, that, that was a challenge at Dapper because you wanted to make sure that your true fans had a real chance of getting the things that they wanted to get not necessarily to people that were writing bots and and then turning around and then selling them for a profit. So Absolutely. these are all challenges that continue to exist with many platforms. I think the company did a, did a great job and the people did a great job um, addressing a, a lot of this stuff. And we're trying to address this at NFT Star as well to make sure that we connect directly with, with the fans um, uh, so that we create great experiences for both the athletes and the fans. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, the part I wanted to uh, stay on for a second here is the, um, you know, we're, we're talking about blockchain here and, and crypto, etc. But I think the the trick of Dapper really was, or or NFT, uh, the, the the NBA Top Shop part was that it was very easy, right? You use your credit card, I think, uh, service, so it it didn't feel like you're buying a cryptocurrency, right? It wasn't a complicated process. You didn't have to buy Ethereum and then buy the next thing, right? Uh, Flow or whatever. Uh, it was just a, the same way you would purchase anything else online, right? I think that was, I would say, part of the trick, really, right? Would you agree with that, or? Yeah, that was that was certainly a central. Uh, a, it was a primary thought, right? When you're thinking mm -hmm. about how to create the best experience for end users that let's call it the web 2.0 experience for lack of a better right. you know by lack of a better phrase that experience is what people understand now the challenge with that experience is that you're sort of taking away some of that self custody right. um, aspect those self custody aspects that make web3 and blockchain so compelling um, but i think you know one of the one of the things that we think about again as nft star is this idea of web 2.5 mm -hmm. and um, and I think with Dapper, that was a central part uh, of the thought process. How do you reduce friction and make that experience so easy? Because if you do that, you'll delight your users and the overall community and the product will flourish as a result. So that was very much a, you know, a, a, a premeditated, um, you know, idea. It wasn't something that happened by accident. Right. And, and who came up with the, I mean, why is it, I think the, the top shots are what, seven seconds or eight in that sort of ballpark. Well, how was the, the, you know, how long should it be? You know, was that some, you know, just flip of a coin or, or was there some thoughts behind it? Smarter minds than mine. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Um, Folks, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure there was some back and forth with with the NBA. You know, I think if you look at um, if you look at uh, the sweet spot of some of these uh, some of these plays, these dunks, three pointers, assists, crossovers, right. you know, block shots, whatever. You know, you want to create some consistency, and I, I imagine there there was some process where the average you know, time to show the play in a meaningful way, you know, fell, fell around, uh, around that time. Now, uh, before we just move quick, move on here, last question, uh, before you left Dapper, um, 
uh, nearly you know with, with NBA top shows being that successful, certainly they're talking to I'm sure every other uh, league and major sporting platform around the world from FIFA etc. Uh, which I've heard and and but I've heard really seen any sort of big announcement lately. Maybe I missed it. Um, anything you can share what what they're working on or what you were working on when you before you were leaving there? Yeah, I don't you know I can't really speak to what the company's doing now and right. and who they're talking to, but. You know, definitely for a while, the company was on the tip of everyone's tongue, yes. you know, and uh, and it's, you know, you see the NFL signed uh, a deal with Dapper and I, I believe the product, well, the product's out in the market now okay. and a few football, uh, European football leagues, you know, also signed deals uh, with the company. And so, you know, they're definitely, um, they're definitely one of the prominent players still in the space. You know, one of the challenges for me is, you know, this idea of putting out trading cards. You know, uh, if you look at the 1990s, you know, the company or companies that were prominent at that time putting out trading cards, you know, they they were on death's door. And one of the reasons was in order for the companies to make more money, they had to print more cards. Right. And they weren't transparent with their audiences um, that they were printing more cards. And as a result, in the 1990s, we saw a massive decline in collection of trading cards, uh, baseball or basketball or football, or whatever your interest was. And, and so even in the NFT world, one of the challenges that I see with, with Dapper um, is this idea that, you know, like every week that you put out new packs and new trading cards and new, and new moments, as they're called, yep. you're, you're effectively diluting the universe of um, moments that are already minted. And for me, you know, that was something that didn't necessarily sit all that well. And then when I saw the opportunity to say, okay, well, there are some great, I mean, they're all great athletes, but there are some great brands and great athletes, um, you know, and there's this world where they're connecting with, you know, with an, with audiences, let's say through marketing. Um, and that would be through, you know, endorsement deals and other things, but they're not connecting directly with their fans. And I think connecting directly with, with, with the fans creates so many interesting opportunities for both the fans and the athletes. Um, and the relationship between the fan and the athlete, but the relationship also between the fans. And so when I when I started thinking about kind of what you know, if we were to push uh, NFTs and we would look at, you know, what the world might look like a year, two years from now uh, and beyond, you know, one of the things that I that I really wanted to look at is um, in this idea of exploring the opportunities with individual athletes, helping those athletes share their stories of where they came from, where they're going, um, build communities around those athletes, around allowing those athletes to drive things like charitable projects and charitable endeavors, but also allow them to sort of experiment and do things that they would enjoy and their fans would enjoy. And so that's kind of, you know, uh, what pulled me out of that uh, universe into uh, the universe that I'm in right now. Yeah, let's talk about that. NFT star. So you're the CEO and a co-founder. So you're back as an entrepreneur there. Um, talk about what is the vision of the company? And, you know, when I just read what I saw on the on your website, it says building this the, the biggest sports stadium in the Web3 metaverse. So earlier you called it the Web 2.5, uh, but now yeah. you obviously want to go in Web3, and clearly that's, that is a buzzword as the word metaverse. Um, tell us, what does that mean to you um, and what the company is all about? Yeah, maybe a little too many, uh, a little little too much on the buzzword side, but <laughs> we, we are, uh, we're building a, a sports. So we believe, first of all, first and foremost, we believe at NFT Star that the metaverse is not uh, is not a, a monolith. Mm -hmm. We believe in uh, verticalized experiences that are interoperable. Mm -hmm. And so what we are building is really a sports centric metaverse. Uh, that metaverse uh, it will be powered by NFTs and powered by the community and their involvement in it. Right. And within that metaverse, there's virtual experiences, there's mobile games, there's a, there's a connection um, or you know a connection between physical and real world events into the virtual world. Um, so uh, you know so, the, so so to me the metaverse isn't necessarily purely its own world. You know there's in, there, there's overlap and intersection with with the real world and events that are happening in the real world. And we're doing this and we're launching this with some of the top uh, sports stars mm -hmm. uh, in the world across uh, multiple sports. 
Yeah, and, and let's so, name a few of them because uh, you, know, yeah. there, you have some big names there. You have uh, Neomar, uh, Louis Figo, uh, Son from Tottenham, uh, Giannanis, if I pronounce his name correctly. Uh, you know, these are big names. Um, so how did you, A, pick them and or, you know, what the relationship um, to start with? You worked with an agency or, or how are you guys currently, you know, picking your stars? Yeah. So, so, so again, we, we believe really strongly that like this universe can exist for any athlete or any group of athletes, but it was really important for us to work with some of the top athletes in the world in order to bring it to market. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we work directly with the, uh, the athletes and their agents. Mm -hmm. And so we are working directly with the athletes. All of the athletes themselves have said, ultimately have said, yes, we want to work with NFC star you know, both for their expertise, but also, you know, in their background, but also for our vision for what we want to do uh, for them and for the company as we pr proliferate, uh, you know, uh, what we call, again, the sports, me the sports centric metaverse and uh, the NFTs around um, that metaverse. And so, so yeah, Neymar, uh, who is, you know, I would certainly say one of the greatest soccer players of all time, who's still, you know, actively a superstar. Yeah. Um, Giannis from the Milwaukee Bucks, who, you know, NBA champion, NBA all-star. Absolutely. Um, and, and still arguably, again, one of the best players in the league. Uh, Hyung, Hyungman's son, a golden boot winner. Uh, again, one of the best soccer players in the world. Certainly one of the best offensive players uh, in the world. And Luis Figo. Uh, a historical, I would say, a historically great player, Absolutely. part of the golden generation. Real Madrid, <laughs> exactly, exactly, part of the golden generation. Um, Christian McCaffrey, who broke many, many records during his college uh, playing days, and you know, one of the best running backs in the NFL. And so, uh, and there are a number of others we haven't yet announced. And for us, we look at, um, you know, right now we're looking at covering, you know, all interesting and I should, all important sports. I shouldn't say important. We're, we're looking to cover all sports and we're looking to basically attract the top players in those sports uh, for our launch. And then after we, you know, after we fully launch, that's when the platform will open up to a broader world uh, of athlete or group of athletes. And so I think there's a world where group of groups of athletes come together to sort of build interesting things. And those can be athletes cross sport. Um, and again, one of the reasons we are looking at soccer or football, I should say, American football, basketball, um, you know, all these different sports is because we do believe there's actually a lot of overlap. I myself am proof of that, right? I watch, uh, you, know, my, you know, my poison is the EPL. Um, you know, I love the NBA. Um, you know, I watch uh, I watch IPL cricket. Um, and so for me, you know, like the intersection of these sports, athletes can get together and do really interesting things. I agree. Um, yeah. And so and so ultimately, that's where we're headed. Okay. okay. Um, so first of all, when did the company start? I know it's fairly recent. Um, so in you know, will you consider it a startup still in startup mode? I'm assuming, um, or where? How would you describe it right now? Yeah, the company was founded uh, in 2021, so last year. Okay. Um, uh, in the middle, middle to second half of last year, and the bulk of the second half of last year was really around trying to find out trying to hone in on what we want to do mm -hmm. and the athlete partners that we want to do it with. Mm -hmm. uh, and then this year, <clears throat> you know, we've spent time uh, building uh, a lot of the platform and then come end of August, early September is when we will be releasing in earnest, um, you know, what I would call our first real NFT collection. We did launch a Youngman Sun collection a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, and that was uh, an experimental sort of learning collection mm -hmm. for us. Um, but the Neymar, the first Neymar collection will be coming out uh, at the end of August or the beginning of September. And that collection will really will really uh, showcase uh, one part of the direction of the company. Um, one of the, again, one of the things that we care a lot about is building this sort of universe of sport and um, and not necessarily, you know, putting out uh, headshots of athletes, right? right? There are some NFT companies out there and they're great companies doing well, and they're really focused on delivering a headshot of an athlete, mm -hmm. or they're really trying to deliver a slam dunk 
or you know whatever whatever sport it is, whatever action it is. And for us, we're really trying to create experiences that are built around games, that are built around um, user to user, fan to fan, uh, trash talking and communication. And so when we look at our NFT collections, some are free, some are paid, some of them uh, will allow you to unlock experiences within a mobile game that we'll be launching. Okay. Um, it won't allow you to necessarily, let's say, win or be better than other players, but it'll it'll unlock experiences. We have we have an NFT uh, style that we call a predictive NFT that will allow you to predict things that will happen in matches. So mm -hmm. how many flops, you know, are you going to see in, in a basketball game or a soccer, a football match? You know how many touches will somebody have? How many how many point you know how many how many goals or how many points someone will have? And you'll be able to mint all of these things on the blockchain in advance of of a match or a season, and you'll have bragging rights. And right. if you're correct, you can come back and burn those NFTs and mint essentially a a trophy or a prize. And so the, really the thing here is how do you engage users in this world that we're creating? Um, that's foundationally being represented by these athletes. And so the first Neymar collection, it's, you know, what you'll find is it's not going to be headshots, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be immersing your immersing in a fantasy world um, that revolves around Neymar, but that enters you into the football universe. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, and I, and I want to stick, uh, I'm sort of scrolling through the website as we speaking here, and I want everyone to check out nftstar.com, very easy to find. Um, and, and your graphics look great. I, I really like the uh, the visual part of it. Uh, it looks, uh, looks very exciting. Uh, uh, and uh, but I, well, the part I want to spend a bit of time on is you know, sort of uh, the part which to me uh, looks like, a, but I has a feel of a white paper, right? Where you're talking about the different parts and components which you'll be building from what you call, like, which is explained, the stars, the fan clubs, the premium NFTs, the P2E game, Meta Stadium, and the Star Coin. Uh, let, let's talk a bit about those things because uh, they're really exciting. Uh, we're doing something similar in the esports and gaming space. Um, so a lot of the things I'm reading here look a bit similar to what we have on our platform, which is called Z7DAO. And the word DAO, again, I want to come back to later as well because you kind of touched a bit on it as well, you know, the whole concept of de being decentralized for fans. Um, but let's let's talk about you know you you know we we touched on this the the stars part and and the NFTs here but you know what, how does the fan club and and the P two E game how do these things come together to land into the meta stadium here? Yeah, so so again, like one of the things that really it, fundamentally that I think about is Web three and the blockchain gives users this opportunity to to really own whatever it is that that they're owning. And it also gives organizations and companies the opportunity to not only rely on those users to help build their businesses, right? And it's it's a two-way street, right? We're delivering experiences and the users are enjoying those experiences and it's sort of the symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. But from a financial perspective, you know, the idea that the users are driving, um, driving your success, in many ways they should be rewarded for um, you know, for helping drive that success, and you right. see that in YouTube, for example, right, where you know creators are uh, rewarded for driving YouTube success, but users are not necessarily rewarded from driving Correct. that success, and they're the ones that are driving the financial success ultimately. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we have a number of things on the horizon, um, all culminating in. Uh, in this idea that our metaverse won't be a land metaverse in the same way that you know some other metaverses are, ours will be a virtual stadium, mm -hmm. and and a lot of the experiences will uh, extend out of experiences that you already have in the real world, right? So if you are a season ticket holder, for example, being a season ticket holder gives you access, right? You you have tickets to every single game. So mm -hmm. as a seat holder, for example, in our metaverse, that will also give you uh, you know, certain certain access points. Some of those things, you know, we may hold events in our in our meta stadium. And if you don't want to use your ticket, uh, whatever revenue gets generated, let's say from that event, some portion of it will go back to to seat holders. Right. Because what you're what you'll be owning is a is a seat in the in the meta stadium. Um, this idea 
that you can then have clubhouses within um, within the Meta Stadium. You can do tailgating in the parking lot, mm -hmm. uh, which is a popular activity, particularly yeah. you know in football. Yep. And 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 these are sort of like you know very specific experiences that you'll have participating in this sort of Meta Stadium. If you have a seat in the Meta Stadium, or if you own an NFT or a series of NFTs or or what have you, you can combine those NFTs to you know again, unlock experiences within the Meta Stadium, but also unlock experiences within a mobile game. So we have a, we have a mobile game that we're working on, which will be, uh, which will be a football oriented, a soccer oriented uh, mobile game. And again, by holding NFTs or maybe holding um, uh, uh, seats in, in our Meta Stadium, you'll be able to um, have unique experiences in the mobile game. And then there's also sort of virtual chat rooms um, where if, for example, in the World Cup, uh, you know, two countries might be playing each other and let's say you want to be in a room to trash talk with your friends or with a broader community, you'll have the opportunity to enter into one of these rooms. Oh, and by the way, if you happen to have an NFT from somebody on that team or within that sport, you'll be able to have token gated experiences to unlock, uh, you know, maybe unique trash talking avatars um, or trash talking emojis. Uh, and so it's really, we're really looking at those types of things. I love it. It, it sort of brings me back uh, in 2017, 18, um, we launched a uh, streaming platform it was called Sports Fix at the time. And, and again, that was just when I got to sort of uh, get into the world of blockchain and we tried to put it on the blockchain. That was sort of supposed to be the first OTT platform on blockchain. And the word digital stadium is exactly what we used. Uh, and the concept was similar is the fans to actually allow to tell us what it is they want to watch, you know, by tokenizing it, by saying, okay, you can vote with your token of really what is the content we should be acquiring uh, on the back of it. So a lot of the, you know, terms you're using here, meta stadium, et cetera, the word meta wasn't really around that at the time. Uh, but yeah, we had the same idea. Uh, didn't quite take off uh, the way we wanted it, but um, those are all in our early days here. And, and I think you similar, you were in a very early day here. Um, so you guys are, you know, you raised uh, funds or are you raising it through the token, you know, sort of the token race here or how you guys are currently funded and, and building this? Yeah, we don't have a token. Um, and right now there's no plans to, that's not to say that we, 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 you know, we may, we may or may not in the future. Um, and so right now we're, 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 uh, uh, we're funded uh, privately funded, mm -hmm. so uh, we're, we're primarily funded through another corporate through through another company that's a that's a publicly listed company on the Nasdaq called the Nine, mm -hmm. and so they are uh, they are the uh, the primary or largest shareholder investor in the company, and you know we're we're likely gonna uh, gonna go out and raise uh, another round of financing um, after we launch the Neymar collection, the Giannis, the first Giannis collection. Uh, and then and then as we move into the World Cup later this year, with some of the other services that we're building, we'll go out and raise a little bit more money um, early next year. But but right now, you know, we're, we're well funded um, uh, and, and no token on the horizon at the moment. Got it. Now, let's talk about play to earn. That's again, probably a very overused term in, in, in the blockchain world across any game, basically, not just sports, right? Um, any esports game or, or game, uh, video game has that terminology now. And you know, then you have the you have the NFT games now. You know, if you're talking uh, Axis Infinity, etc. Um, and some say, you know, some work and some haven't, right? And I'm sure if you follow you follow the space very closely, Axis Infinity was a huge hit um, and is having problems right now because. It ends up t turning a bit into a sp Ponzi scheme to some degree, right? And that is just the way the tokenomics was structured, and you know, maybe it is a, it wasn't fully developed yet. Um, how do you guys deal with that, uh, and or where you know how are you doing it differently? Yeah, I think um, this is a really important point, and that is in the in the NFT crypto blockchain world, at, when it comes to games, people need to build compelling games. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be we're building, you know, we want to be able to sell NFTs or we want to be able to sell tokens. So how do we do that? You know, how do we build a game around that idea? Um, and I think that's, you know, those are the challenges that, 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 
you know some players you know some of these companies are having right now because they didn't build compelling games they built they built a greed engine in many ways right, right? people found that they could make money and uh, and so that's what's driven the uh, their DAUs and MAUs and you know their, their active users right. uh, and and what's happening now is it, you know they're not making the money and so they're faltering yep. so at NFT Star we're looking at the experience the game experience first and foremost and so you know our our virtual sports bars our what we call our chat rooms like those are those are user experience first and then play to earn at layered layered on top and that's why we also say you know that's why we also i also like to call us web 2.5 cuz we're taking the things that people know and love um and then we're layering in uh, in 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 the most seamless ways possible, all the Web three stuff. Mm. So you can imagine if you're in a chat room and you are using and you're trash talking and you're using you know new emojis and you're really enjoying that experience. Or let's say during a match, Luis Figo is uh, commentating on the match, or maybe he's doing a post match talk. And if you're a seat holder, you know you can um, experience that. Well, your experience. And your contribution, let's say, to the to the to the chat rooms, to the virtual spaces, that's the play to earn. So the more you participate, the more you you create network effects, right? Your involvement benefits everybody else's involvement. The more you do that, the more you will continue to earn. And for us, that earning is not financial. And I think that's really important. We're not building a speculative platform. Right. We're building a, an engagement platform where the NFTs. Um, our utility to unlock experiences, and you don't have to always pay for them, right? right. The, those experiences can be unlocked by just showing up, by showing that you're a fan of the sport or a fan of the athlete. So as you as you participate in these experiences, you're rewarded with points or tokens, and then those things can be redeemed for jerseys. You, maybe you can, you'll be able to um, enroll in a lottery that delivers a an autographed. Uh, jersey or an autograph shirt or a set of boots or you know whatever it is um with with young men's son we did a jersey with his footprint on it um okay. which was really unique and so that is that is how we look at play to earn it ultimately it's about creating great experiences for the community and the fans and if if you're creating those great experiences they're going to continue to participate and why not continue to reward that community with their, you know, for their participation, and that's how we look at earn. Yeah, no, absolutely, and, and that makes complete sense. And and, and we're as I, we're on a similar path, uh, just in a, in this case, actually in the in the esports world, not in the traditional sports world where you're currently at. So when you when you work with the stars here, with these big names, you know they're busy. They're still, you know, many of them uh, maybe outside of Lewis uh, still playing. Of course, uh, how engaged are they, and and how do you you know how you guys collaborate? Uh, maybe just just a little example there. Yeah, so um, you're right. The athletes that are uh, active in their sport, Giannis and Neymar, Christian McCaffrey, you know, all these folks, uh, uh, Son, they're not going to be engaged in the same way during the season as they might be in the off season. But uh, I would say that they are deeply engaged. So everything that we do, let's say from an NFT perspective, flows through uh, the approval of the individual athletes. Mm -hmm. So they're fully involved uh, in the process. This isn't, you know, this isn't something that we just do and, and we'll put out whatever we want to put out. So, so they are involved. When you see the Neymar NFT drop, Neymar, you know, is involved and his team is involved in every detail, including, you know, like, hey, the shape of the nose is not perfect. So, <laughs> right. okay. so let's, you know, let's move the line over by, you know, look a, a little fraction, better. Okay. Fraction, a fraction of a millimeter. Yeah. And so, so the athletes are all, um, are, are all directly and deeply involved. Uh, they're all involved in creating experiences as well. So when we wanted, let's say we did the Sun, you know, autographed uh, jersey and footprint jersey, um, obviously he was involved because it was his his footprint and his autograph. Right. But he's involved in that conversation to figure out how to how to deliver the best experiences for the fans. Um, and so some athletes will be more involved in virtual experiences around AMAs around um you know maybe post game commentary 
uh, around other types of video chats and meet and greets and other types of things. Uh, and others will be less involved, but every athlete is involved in, in frankly, every step of the process, which I think is also unique to us. Whereas other platforms are working directly with leagues or agents, we are working directly with the agents and the athletes. Right. Another question here, uh, if you've got a little more time, is the, you know, the athlete obviously wears a jersey, whatever team he plays in at that moment in time, and he plays in a league, and therefore, you know, contractually always rights become very complicated, right? Especially if you're talking about the match action, uh, you know, who owns what. Um, obviously, Dapper figured that out with the NBA um, with a certain formula. Um, now, you're dealing obviously only with the stars, which my assumption is in most cases, they will obviously not be wearing the uniforms of the team they're representing and, and it's their own IP, everything they control. Or have you also crossed over already to work with you know, their respective teams? We made a conscious decision not to not to worry about that side of the action. Right. There's plenty of companies out there focused on acquiring the rights for, you know, live the live sport action. And for us, uh, one of the one of the things that the athletes frankly were gravitated towards was the idea that we want to tell their story. Mm -hmm. And part of their story is, where they came from, how they became the stars that they became, right? right? So that, so like Giannis has such a colorful past, you know, yeah. growing up in Athens and, you know, there's a great documentary that, you know, that that's out about his life and we want to be able, you know, and we talked about representing that mm -hmm. um, for him to be able to tell his story on his terms with his narration yeah. um, over illustration, over, over um, animation and, and all that. So, so that's one part of it. The other part of it is we're trying to create immersive community experiences. And those community experiences, in, in my opinion, don't start from, uh, you know, a slam dunk, uh, you know, highlight reel. Those community experiences come from, you know, creating these immersive universes, right? In many ways, like games, right? Yeah, so yeah. how do you create? And, and again, you'll see this with our Neymar um, collection when it comes out. But how do you create these immersive experiences and these stories that are fantasy around the athlete, but still bring you into the sport and allow interaction between fans and fan to athlete. So that is where we're focused. And, you know, when people see uh, our, our upcoming, you know, NFT collection and then subsequent services that, that, that will launch um, products and features that will launch, it'll, it'll all become really apparent that, Hey, collecting NFTs isn't speculative. It shouldn't always be speculative and it shouldn't be about buying and selling. And it shouldn't be about, Hey, I, I collected this slam dunk. It should be like, it's going to be this immersive experience around live, live matches. It's going to be an immersive experience around this sort of fantasy aspect of, and I don't mean fantasy from a sports betting perspective or whatever, but like, like a fantasy world aspect in terms of representation of the athletes and, and what can be done with those, with those NFTs uh, in the ecosystem that we're creating. So that is the approach we're taking, not the approach that, Hey, we have to have, you know, in game action in order to sell, you know, that NFT, that's not the approach that we take. Yeah, I like it. Uh, and again, if you think about, you know, UFC's Ultimate Fighter, which really, you know, most people would uh, regard as what took the UFC to another level, which was all behind the scene, right? It wasn't, you know, just being in front of it or, or you know, you know, F uh, Formula One's Drive to Survive right now on, on Netflix, right? It's... It isn't just always the action itself. It's really uh, the, what the stars do and how they get there and, and how tough it is to be one of them uh, and wherever they may come from. I'm sure Neymar coming out of Brazil has amazing stories and similar to uh, uh, Giannis, uh, you know, Greek stories there. So I've, I have no doubt, uh, you know, or, or a son. So I think you have some interesting ones there from different parts of the world. Uh, which all have unique experiences and become stars in lots of cases, not in their home country. Right? Uh, you know, Tom, son is a star in the UK, John is in the US, and Neoma now in, in Europe. So uh, uh, playing for PSG, which interesting enough is the team where you have a, an esports team with. So we have the Paris Saint Germain esports team here. So we're happy to have them there. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah and we talked about this earlier, which is the progression of like the team to the celebrity of the athlete. And if we really want to expand on that, uh, on that opportunity and that idea, it, it's, it's, you're right. It's not centered around the gameplay. It's centered around all the other things that they represent for their fans and followers. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I know, exciting. Well, we could keep going here, but I know we have we have a, a time limit here. Um, Gangana, that was fun. I, I really enjoyed this. Hope we can t talk some more once you're live and ready and, and we start seeing uh, you know the first iterations of what we just touched on um, once we see the Meta Stadium and Starcoin out there. Um, so let's hope we can have another chance to, to dig deeper into it. And uh, in the meantime, I wish you best of luck. If anyone wants to reach out, if there is uh, you know an agency or a player who would love to talk more to, how do they reach you? Uh, they can email us. Um, they can email me, uh, Guggen at nftstar.com. And then uh, I think on our website, somewhere in the footer, there's also an email address that they can reach us on. But yeah, happy to happy to have conversations with anyone. And, and thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Have a great day there in San Francisco and talk to you soon. Thank you. You Cheers. too. Bye bye. The Sports Entrepreneurs by Marcus Lure Podcasts are a collection of interviews and stories. All content in this podcast is the copyright of Marcus Lure. Reproduction and distribution of the presentation without written permission of the owner is prohibited. All rights reserved.